make sure to give my dad a five star review. Get, make sure to like and subscribe to his YouTube. Thank, thank you for listening and enjoy the, the show. show. <laughs> we have had Christians stand up in our defense when it's like in cases in Arkansas where we were putting up our Baphomet monument. There were a couple Christian ministers who actually spoke at our rally before uh, before the state house when we were arguing for our right to have our monument up near the, the Ten Commandments monument on the same public grounds. Hey, welcome back, faithful politics listeners and viewers. If you're watching us on our YouTube channel, I am your political host, Will Wright, and I'm joined by your faithful host, Pastor Josh Bertram. How's it going, Josh? Doing well. Thanks, Will. Hey, and this week we have with us Lucian Greaves. He is the spokesman and co-founder of the Satanic Temple, whose mission is to encourage benevolence and empathy, reject tyrannical authority, advocate practical common sense, oppose injustice, and undertake noble pursuits. And if you think the Satanic Temple is a place to sell your soul, uh, get rich, or join the Illuminati, as their website says, you have to look elsewhere. So welcome so much. Nice. Uh, yeah, thanks for being here on the show, Lucian. We're really uh, glad to have you. Thanks for being here, Thank man. you. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. So, um, the Satanic Temple. Give us a brief overview of what the Satanic Temple is. What are the core beliefs? Um, and oh, and then maybe you can tell us kind of what your personal journey is to to get to the point where you you co-founded uh, the Satanic Temple. I always try to think about the best ways to explain this to people coming at it from the outside, and I don't think. I've found necessarily the best way to uh, address everybody's concerns up front. But I think uh, there are certain things that are common to people's reactions when I tell them that we're a non-theistic religious organization involved in these often ostensibly political pursuits. People feel like I'm kind of signaling to them that we don't actually view ourselves as an actual religion, but more as a tool in the fight against Christian nationalism and what we see as theocratic impositions into politics. Because because we're always fighting, if people have heard of us at all, for equal representation in public forums, uh, our right to free expression on grounds where They've set up what are supposed to be pluralistic uh, forums for for free speech. And people think that that's all of what we're trying to do and that our message is in, entirely intended to be projected onto other people in a set of disingenuous beliefs that are inflammatory and, and provocative and, and meant to offend. And that's the most difficult thing to get people to look beyond is that I think some people are attracted to us for that purpose because they do see us as insulting their enemy and the friend of their and the enemy of their enemy is going to be their friend kind of thing and and sometimes they're very disappointed to see that we actually take this context and framework very seriously and I think some people wonder how that could even be if it's something that they feel is just predicated on offending other people. How can we take this seriously as a set of ethical values? And everything exists in contrary to something else, I, I would say. You know, uh, even the, the words of Jesus were uh, in, in contradiction to uh, prior traditions and in and, and, and revolt to certain circumstances of the day. But that doesn't mean you don't have your own affirmative values that are defined by those. And that said, there is a wide spectrum constituting what we consider Christendom at this point. There are very liberal Christians, and of course, there's an outsized voice right now for very conservative Christians and ones who might not have a, uh, a complete dedication to the democratic virtues that we think we uphold. And so it's not something where it's like, we are making commentary about what we think Christians are or must be. This, I think, when people are responding with some sense of opposition to 
the Christian religion and embracing blasphemy as a declaration of personal independence from superstitions they held, it's more about them. It's more about what this became to them. And it's more about the kind of programming that they may have undergone when they were younger. We can understand that Christianity might mean something to other people that's more in alignment with our own belief systems, but the iconography doesn't work for us for whatever reason. It means something else. A lot of us look at, say, the Westboro Baptist Church, and we disagree with them wholeheartedly, but we may also feel that regardless of what we might think of their moral stance, we don't think it's necessarily bad theology. And for us, that's what this narrative means. And we can respect people of a more liberal bent who, who, uh, who can see what we're doing and the value and the kinds of things that we're doing. And to that end, we have had Christians stand up in our defense when it's like in cases in Arkansas where we were putting up our Baphomet monument. There were a couple of Christian ministers who actually spoke at our rally before uh, before the state house when we were arguing for our right to have our monument up near the, the Ten Commandments monument on the same public grounds. So another part of people's reticence, I think, to accept us sometimes as an authentic religion is the lack of a well-defined, lengthy set of dogmas, because we try to think of ourselves more as a process, I would think. Um, I'm not held up and venerated as a central figurehead with some kind of infallible words, but we hold up science as an arbiter to truth claims. And the process of being a Satanist, I think, optimally, is that ability to strip away conclusions of all kind of cultural biases, traditions, and other things that might uh, that might deviate uh, one's sense of clarity from what the what the core truth is, and try to look beyond all of that and come in and, and come to a, a a rationalization based on the best available evidence. And that is not easy. That is that is not easy at all. It, it it's not easy. It's not as easy as proclaiming yourself left or right in any case. And I think that's where the, the issue comes in now is people feel that everything boils down to this dichotomy in one side is going to be absolutely right on everything. And the other side is going to be absolutely wrong in that there's just some kind of consensus amongst people who identify with these tribes who can tell you which is so. And as time goes on, I feel we've reached this distressing point in time where people are just relying on those consensuses that they see on social media and, and other forums uh, for for dictation of what to, what a truth claim is, which truth claims are valid and which are not. And I think uh, now more than ever, it's both difficult to get people to truly understand what we are and that we're not just another inflammatory voice in the culture war, because it could certainly appear that way. Um, but it's also a time of real opportunity for us because it is a culture war. And, you know, a lot of times the people who would position themselves as our opposition do more to give people an understanding of what our value is by showing us, by showing people uh, us in contrast to them, and, and when some of their own agendas are so poorly thought and and opposed to basic social reforms. Yeah. So, so, so you you created uh, or you co-founded it uh, with another person. Like, like, can you walk us through sort of the I don't know, the origin story of, of building this, this institution. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And it, I, uh, at first the whole process of, of us becoming this organization, uh, felt too messy and ad hoc to me, to me, for me to have any proper respect for it myself. And now in retrospect, I kind of feel like, uh, there was no other way 
in which this could have gone as well as it did so that it would be in the hands of people who were principled enough to not let it degenerate into something it, it that wouldn't be helpful, I don't think. And I mean, to, to clarify, th- I certainly did not feel that I would make a good public person. It wasn't something I was inclined to do. It wasn't something I had any interest in. And it's something it's to me, it was a horrific idea especially given that I did uh, have a real background in studying witch hunts and moral panics, particularly the satanic panic of the 1980s and 1990s. And I knew how people's lives were sometimes ruined by accusations of Satanism, where Satanism was nowhere to actually be found. So the idea of being a public face of Satanism and opening the door to that kind of reputational assault and, you know, perhaps false accusation or whatever else was something I I didn't take lightly and not something I actually intended to do. But we were, uh, you know, me and this colleague of mine, uh, he was he wanted to make a film about uh, efforts of an alternative religion uh, asking for the same rights as that were only being asked at the time essentially by proselytizing evangelical Christians. And at that time, I already uh, had quite an affinity for and identified with Satanism, but silently, it wasn't something I wanted to make myself a pariah over. I had realized from studying the Satanic Panic that the common threads amongst people who identified as Satanists were much different than what people would anticipate. It It was often rooted in general concerns about the lack of moral integrity of of society overall and the tendency for moral self-licensing among those who felt they already held a moral high ground. A lot of times people self-identified as Satanists even prior to the establishment of the Satanic Temple due to what they saw as failings within traditional organizations, religions, and other such things. And so I felt I had a, a quite an understanding of that. And Satanism was something that I felt was a well-poised idea to show people that diametrically opposed viewpoints also have religious liberty as well. And if you're willing to open that door for one, you should be willing to open it for another. That's what living in a pluralistic democracy is. We need to find that level ground where we can accept this latitude of rights that religions have in a way that we know it's not going to encroach upon reasonable people, non-believers, other other such people who uh, shouldn't be held under the thumb of other people's belief systems. And I feel the only way to do that is by having these kinds of oppositional forces within that kind of market. Otherwise, there becomes a real kind of power imbalance in in a sick with power kind of attitude in which people keep trying to elevate the privileges of religion because they think it's only going to benefit one specific set of legislation or viewpoints. So we wanted to do this. And originally, we thought we could do this a couple times. We would do a few activities and wouldn't have to put my face to it. I could write the rationales. And then we thought other people would follow. I was certain that there were enough people who were self-identified Satanists who really didn't have any type of central authority, nor did they want one, and that we would see people regionally waving the banner of the Satanic Temple and doing these types of things, picking up that flag and and, uh, and, and doing these kinds of projects, but of varying viewpoints of different regional flavors and uh, expressing different types of needs for the type of people who would do that. Well, we found that really didn't happen um, uh, against my uh, my anticipation. Uh, a lot of people really wanted to join with us, do what what we were doing alongside of us. They wanted to know how to sign on. Uh, they didn't necessarily want to do these things on their own or start up a, a regional group from the ground up. And so we started registering people. And right away, we knew this had to become a a real organization. And then 
at the point where my face started being uh, placed on on news stations and articles and things like that, it, it got a lot more attention than I thought it would. Uh, that was it. I needed to either vindicate this thing or <laughs> or know that you know now I, or never, right? Put up a shut yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that became that became what it was for me. Yeah, that makes a lot of that makes a lot of sense. So I gotta ask, man. As a pastor, thinking about the satanic temple, I got to ask, so when I hear satanic, I think of spiritual things. I think of a spiritual being with great power. I think of a spiritual being in opposition to God. So I kind of think of like an acknowledgement of Satan is kind of an acknowledgement of God, but then I'm not really hearing that. So what? To help me understand the What's the imagery? What's the, is, is Satan is the is the character of Lucifer just a a cool like role model because it, you know in literature it 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 rejects all authority and and shuns all authority. Kind of help me understand even the idea of satanic as like a religion as opposed to just getting a shock value. What's the I, and you kind you started to explain it, but go deeper into like. What is the imagery and the analogy behind that name? What what are you trying to get at with it? Well, I mean, to us, I think the the biblical Satan is a little unclear. The the character you, you start For out sure. with the idea sure. of Satan or as a Satan, you know, as an adversary, and then kind of develops into a character that uh, there there feels to be some kind of some some ambiguity as to uh, the depth of the evil of this character, at least in certain parts. Is this the character sure. who can go to uh, God and, and speak uh, as kind of a kind of a drinking buddy about Job and see, like uh, you know, well, what can we do to to, to test the faith? Or is yes, this yes. absolutely oppositional to to God and the author of all evil? Which is, of course, a kind of framework we reject, but I feel like for Satanists, the real kind of uh, first real satanic Bible would be Milton's Paradise Lost, because then you really get kind of this coherent narrative of Satan as the ultimate rebel against tyranny. And we understand that Christians can say that, you know, well, that's not, that's not the Satan we, we know, that's not the Satan we're envisioning when we when we hear this but for us it it is and if you the the real point of departure here is going to be supernatural beliefs whether we have them or if we don't sure, we don't sure. and we view satan as literary so towards that end we don't have any real reservations against looking at this heroic model of satan people who feel that satan is is literally the author of evil are probably never going to see eye to eye to that and always think we're in error. And, and the best sure. we can do is try to convince them that it's it's something different to us and we're not trying to deceive people by saying yeah. that by giving this kind of uh by by giving this kind of explanation just to try to work Satan insidiously into their lives. But I think then, you know, we get back to that point where People look at the idea of non-theistic religion and think you could have picked something else then, right? People are really pissed off about Satan. But I don't think that's really the case with us. I, I genuinely think that non-theistic religions are going to have their moment in the near future. I think we're going to start seeing non-theistic Christian groups who take the idea of Jesus just as seriously as the people who believe truly in the second coming but without believing in the second coming, just convinced that uh, the, the the thoughts conveyed by Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount, these are just uh, vital precepts to live by, and it's it's not necess it's not necessary that there's a, a literal entity, spiritual entity, uh, Jesus as an isolate consciousness that's actually hearing our prayers and things like that. I think that's going to come, and I think that because non-theistic religion to me, this religion to me is is very real and non-negotiable. Like this idea of Satan isn't something that I could just transfer to some other iconography and, and character. 
And the blasphemy aspect of it is another hard thing to sell to people because they think blasphemy is just used to insult the people for whom this stuff is sacred. But that, again, is kind of assuming, I feel like, that we're some kind of outsiders coming in and criticizing another culture, which isn't true. This is something we grew up in, we were entrenched in. This is kind of the cultural raw material that we were born in. And you can't really just take that from somebody, even a non-believer. You know, it's it's been said of of atheists that there are different uh different flavors of atheists. There's Catholic atheists, there's Muslim atheists, there's and there's a difference between them, you know? And and I feel that that's that's true. And that's there's certainly uh, a level of that in Satanism. And there's also a level, I think, in satanic communities of religious trauma. And a lot of people grew up and they they were pummeled with different types of religious trauma. And to them, this is a way of empowering themselves over that. And I mean, all of this is to say that, you know, it's an uphill battle to mitigate this impression that we are another polarizing force in the culture wars and that we're simply looking to piss off Christians. But it really isn't the case. It, and I, I, I hope I'm doing something of a yeah, good job of explaining of very, what it is. I, I mean, I just, to me, it seems like we, it's just a matter of coming to terms with each other. Because yeah. your term of Satan is very different than my term of Satan. But right. until we're on the same term of what you mean by Satan, and I can understand that when you're saying Satan, you're referring to this specific literary entity that represents certain values that you find sacred or in your own way sacred. And once that happens, then it makes a lot more sense. But I don't think I can ever get rid of my the the voice of my grandmother and mother in my head telling me how bad satanic you know, uh, things are and how they're going to take you and murder your children in the woods and satanic rituals and sacrificial human sacrifice. So that's always going to be in the back of my head, but getting that, getting to terms is so, so good to hear like what's, what your actual heart is. So I appreciate you sharing that. Well, they, you know, it, but there, you know, there's, there's still pushback, you know, people will say, you know, you can have of course, these of course, lofty yeah. ideals, right? But, you know, my grandmother is going to be upset by this, my mother or whoever. My mother is like, going to right. be upset when I tell right. her I interviewed someone right. from the right. satanic, the co-founder of the satanic temple, I promise that. Right. So then then the question becomes, you know, is it that important to you, right? Is it is it worth upsetting people? Well, why upset right. people? Yeah. In my feeling is that this is the kind of upset that helps people. I, I honestly think there's a greater good in upsetting people over issues like this, not just upsetting them for its own sake, but I do think there is a beneficial message to people, especially now, to see that different people can attach different values to different symbols, and they can be wrong about that, But their core ideals may not be wrong, and it's always best to hear people out. And I think there's, I feel like if we can get people to think that way, if we can get people to think a little bit further beyond their immediate biases, we'll have done a positive thing in the world. That's so true. I I love everything you you said, and, and I don't know if I'm just like a... Uh, a sadomasochist or something, but I love talking to people that think differently than I do. Um, I mean, Josh is a good point. I mean, he was a one-time Trump That's voter Trump and voter. comes from a long line of Confederates <laughs> <laughs> soldiers. <laughs> like, here we are. He's my co-host and I love him dearly, you know? And I'm not necessarily saying that about you. I was actually really excited about talking talking with you. I think we would actually probably have a lot lot in common. Uh, but I, I, I want I want to maybe dispel some some myths if we can, or, or maybe, you know, do some clarifications, uh, misconceptions about the satanic temple. Um, and I don't know what all those misconceptions are. So you'll have to, you'll have to kind of just give me from your personal experience and then, and then, but in that, I would love for you to explain, um, why you are not the church of Satan. Cause I know that on your website, you, you made a point to, to, to delineate the, the two organizations. 
Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it's uh, it's a shame that the comparison comes around as often as it does, because the uh, the organizations are quite a bit different, and uh, in fact, it's a little difficult to call the Church of Satan an organization at all. They're an online presence. Uh, Anton LaVey founded the Church of Satan in 1966. For all intents and purposes, it's been fairly debunked since, or defunct, since uh, the 80s or, or 90s. They, they don't engage in any real activities, and they're not, they don't seem entirely clear on what their beliefs are at this point. Uh, Anton LaVey was against abortion, and, uh, you know, the the Church of Satan seems like it wants to align itself a little more with the causes we champion without having, you know, any any real part of them. Uh, it's just, they're, 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 they're just not a cultural force. They, they don't really do anything. And, and their beliefs were predicated more on uh, notions of, of social Darwinism with an obsession with revenge. And they, they really did a lot more, I think, to fashion their beliefs in conscious opposition to what they felt Christian majority beliefs were without necessarily just kind of a clear eyed vision and mission towards building anything better. That makes, uh, that's interesting. I mean, I, I had never heard, I heard Anton LaVey, but I never heard of, uh, I didn't know he was uh, against abortion. That's interesting. Who knew that uh, the evangelical right would have something in common with the founder of the uh, Church of Satan? So that's interesting in and of itself. People like to make a sport, though, of like <laughs> of taking satanic groups and then comparing them to some Christian group that agrees with them. And it's right. It's not really it's not really helpful. It's it's. It perpetuates that idea that we need to take a viewpoint that just says, whatever you're for, we're against it. Nothing could be right. more counterproductive than that. Yeah, yeah, totally. That makes a lot of sense. You know, I got to ask you, how do you define religion as an organization? Because I, I've heard you say that you're religious, right? Or that this is yeah. a religion. So essentially, you're the co-founder of religion and, and, and to... Uh, to go against what you just said in some way that kind of makes you kind of like Jesus you're a co-founder. Well, he was kind of the founder of religion. So it, uh, uh, you can speak to any of that, but what is religion? How do you define that and then place yourself in that category? What, what is religion is kind of like one of those questions, like what is art or, you know, people also one of those annoying philosopher questions. Well, it's one of those unresolvable questions where it's like, Right. It's it's like the uh, Sorites paradox, you know. At what point do uh, do grains of sand become a pile? You know, uh, you, you you can't just take any one or add any one before it becomes a pile of sand. It, it, it's a it's a collective thing, and there's a, a varying degrees uh, before it gets there. And you know, there's right. people who do in academics who study cults and the question is always is still unresolved. What is a cult? So they usually come right. up with checklists and some checklists are more self-serving to people than others sometimes. And some checklists are uh, are important for uh, government benefits. Like we are recognized by the IRS as a 501c3 tax exempt church. Uh, and uh, so that that comes with its own set of of requirements, like the fact that we have regular services, which which we do. And uh, there's I think even our after school clubs were considered part of the legitimacy of us being a religious organization. The iconography, the, the other other such things, not 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 totally clear anymore on what the IRS standards are. But in any case, everybody has their own kind of checklist. And I feel like, you know, the best of those, the best of these analyses that try to look at is a group of cults, is a uh, is, is something art or whatever, is just to uh, take a look away from the the central subject itself and look at its relationship to other people, you know, are people treating this as art? Are 
you know, uh, are, do people have a cultic relationship with this group? You know, and people can have cultic relationships with groups that aren't really uh, trying to cultivate that kind of relationship. And, and but maybe yeah, that's the sure. better way to look at it. And I think if you look at what people are doing in the satanic temple, it's difficult to take away the label of religion from them. You know, we do have services. We do have these communities. We do have people getting this iconography tattooed on them and other such things. And we have people engaging in rituals, even though they don't believe in the supernatural. And that sometimes strikes people as odd. I just point out weddings and funerals to them to kind of get them to think more clearly about what ritual can be in a non-theistic sense. But in, and that's all by the will of the group that's developed around this. I mean, you, you made the comparison that then I become some kind of Jesus character. But in reality, you know, we just kind of set this the the basic framework down and it could have developed in many different ways. We didn't mandate for our local congregations that they need to engage in rituals and things like that. That turns out to be something people are very interested in doing and they do it. So I, I just want to make it clear that I'm not the really the author of all the social dynamics taking place here. In some ways I'm watching it unfold as well. And sometimes the direction it takes might disappoint me in other ways, I'm thrilled. Hmm. Uh, but just the same, there's only so much I can do, especially when the core philosophy is one that uh, it has a, a certain disdain for autocracy. <laughs> That's so yeah, that, that that makes a lot of sense. Okay, okay so I, I pushed a red button on your website. Um, and it, it, uh -oh. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it took me to Samuel Lito's mom's satanic abortion clinic. And um, I would love for you to just talk more about the the aptly named uh, thing that the website took me to. So so what is what is Sam Alito's mom's a satanic abortion clinic, which is actually really kind of fun to say, actually. But uh, but it's it's a it's a mouthful. A, a lot of press was uh, refused to say it and they would just <laughs> re report it as as like the insultingly named or, or something like that. But uh the idea of us having our own clinic that could potentially be um, supported by religious liberty laws, even in the face of anti-abortion legislation, was an idea we had well before Roe v. Wade was overturned. And it, it was because we kind of saw that coming, right? And, and well before Roe v. Wade was overturned, there were a lot of weasel bills being put forward in certain states, which were almost, in some cases, potentially worse than the outright ban because people don't necessarily know what they're dealing with then. Like 72-hour uh, waiting periods, uh, state-mandated material that impresses what we feel is a religious point of view, that getting an abortion kills a unique, independent human life, uh, that type of thing. Uh, it seemed very much faith-based legislation to us. And that was another uh, another case in point for us where there need to be a clear demonstration of the fact that religious belief truly does go both ways. Nobody can say that our beliefs on these matters hold less validity because they feel our religious attachment isn't as strong as, as other people's. I feel like that's a really, that's a really bizarre kind of direction that American politics are going on the question of religious freedom. I feel like we were a lot better off in a, a, a prior time. I think if you look at Jefferson's writings, where it was clear that the idea of religious liberty was meant to embody religious opinion of all types. And I feel like even in you know, as, as late as the early 2000s, when Scalia was in office, or was a justice at least, um, I know people had a lot of a lot of complaints about him, but he was always very consistent on his application of free speech rulings. And he was always very clear that he believed that these writing, uh, that these rulings on behalf of religious liberty 
weren't just meant to benefit people of dogmatic, superstitious belief, but even non-believers as well, people of religious opinion of all types, which brings us back to that whole idea of where is the level ground that we can all coexist on without a feeling that somebody else is imposing their beliefs upon us. And, you know, hopefully we do some things that make people think more clearly about where that balance is. But now I'm just talking and forgot what the original question was. Hey, no worries, <laughs> dude. I was just listening, dude. No, it, it, I was it, just it, listening. The, the, <laughs> the, the, the question was about the, the Sam Alito uh, thing and, and, and abortion clinic. And I, I'm, I'm curious about just the mechanics of it. Like, is it like, are you, are you folks running like an actual clinic or are you, or is it more of an advocacy activist trying to change the legislation and, and some of the states where uh, a person oh, can't? No, it's, it's, a, it's a legitimate clinic. It's a telehealth clinic. So it's not actually a physical space, which would have been a really hard ask to get anybody to work there. But we still <laughs> need to hire, you know, people who are, are, medical professionals, you know, trained registered nurses, people who are able to distribute pharmaceuticals, people who are able to take this kind of information, process it, and legally have the authority to, to work with it. So it was a, it was a huge project. It was, it's, and for us, you know, we're still, it, I'm sure we might look huge, at least by numbers, we look huge, but still you're talking, uh, small group of people working on this on a low budget as far as 501c3s go we don't have membership dues we you know we just sell merchandise and we take donations towards specific projects we're doing so actually the uh the clinic for us was a really big gamble and we thought that you know it, it kind of needed a lot of attention so people could understand what we're doing and donate to it if if they agreed with it. And to be honest, it didn't get that attention and it didn't get those donations. And it was and it's really been kind of a crushing year for us because of that. But we're we're, we're feel like we're starting to level off now. But it was it was, uh, you know, it, it, it was a big project to take on and it was almost a bit too much. I, so I, that gives you some <laughs> some concept, I think, of how big we actually are and what our potential is. Cause people come to us all the time with huge ideas and we would be happy to do it. If we, if we had the resources and the, uh, and the personnel of power, mm -hmm. we, we would be getting into a lot more things. And, you know, just out of politeness, I don't point out how many other progressive organizations are out raking in, you know, orders of magnitude well <laughs> above and beyond what the satanic oh, yeah. temple are doing but if yeah. you look up the satanic temple you can see where it's going you can see that we are litigating that we are active that we are we are putting the question to people you look at some of these other ones what are they doing i kind of i i will be it's a whole different topic but I am really kind sure. of bitter about mm -hmm. what's happened from 2020 till now. And I feel like a lot of progressive groups have a lot to answer for because of the jack shit that they managed to do. You know, this is such a fascinating conversation to me. I, I, I love it. And I, wanna, I wanted to throw this question to you because, right, we have legislation. We're in a pluralistic society. We have to figure out a way to get along or at least tolerate each other, right? Whatever it is, we got, we got to figure this out. Um, or this country is not going to last, quite honestly, if we don't figure this out. If we don't figure this out, this country, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just concerned. Um, so my question is, you know, we have these laws that come out, and at some point the law is going to make a distinction, right? It's going to make some kind of distinction. And people don't like distinctions. We don't like differentiations if, if, unless they're in our favor. Um, we, we tend to not like the differentiations that aren't in our favor, the things that uh, restrain us rather than uh, free us to do what we want to do. And as I'm thinking about this, right, you have this, the, the law is supposed to be secular. I think secular 
to your point early about religion, it is a very undefined term. I think people don't really understand what secular is. I think secular goes in a lot of different ways. Really, all I hear is secular many times is equal to atheist or equal to, and I'm not saying that's what it is, but that's what I, that's what I see or that's what I experience or that's like in different conversations is, is what I'm saying. This idea of what secular, secular means. So you have these sides that are trying to figure out how do we, how do we, how do we, figure out religion because we got to, because if you're a religion and I'm a religion or I'm part of religion, then yeah, we got to figure out um, some limits around those or some kind of boundaries around those because one is they're, they're very different from each other in terms of core beliefs. How do you feel like the law, especially things like, you know, the Supreme court decisions and things like that. I'm curious how would you see as like a ideal balance between say giving the satanic temple what it needs and giving Islam and, and Muslim mosques what they need and versus giving like some independent Baptist church, you know, down in or Westboro Baptist, we'll say that what they need. Where, where do you see that? Um, how do you see that? Go, what's the process? What, what does it look like? What would you look at and say, oh, this le legislation was done well and it's executed in the right way? Well, there, a big controversy with us is that at a certain point in time, around 2016, I think it was, uh, we started rolling out after school programs. And we started doing this because in 2001, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of these proselytizing evangelical clubs called the Good News Clubs. Right. And the ruling, this was back in Scalia's time. And of course, you know, the idea from the ruling was that religious clubs are allowed to operate as after school clubs because they are not part of the school's curriculum. It's not being put on the syllabus. It's merely a matter of making public facilities available to any group that can live up to a certain amount of standards to run a club. And so the government, therefore, needs to be neutral about this. And they can't just say that. Now, now this is where the interpretation, I think, is wrong. They said that categorically denying religions the ability to have after-school clubs was religious discrimination. It was discriminating against religion. I think that's a bit of a stretch. I think if you take a public forum and you say, all right, we don't want religious debate in here. We're not going to have religious representation, but we, you can have whatever else. That that's a bit different to me than religious discrimination. It's truly it's unquestionably discrimination if you say that we're going to allow some religious groups, but not others because we don't like them. Right. right? And, and that's similar to free speech public forums. They'll say that they'll have a limited public forum by which they'll be able to put certain rules on the public forum but not rules that are manufactured just to benefit one group or exclude another. These are general rules applicable to them all. Like if we were putting up a display, a holiday display or something else, and, you know, say the Westboro Baptist Church comes and they want to put up a display that says, God hates fags and all of that, so they, their, their tagline, you know, in in this in the horrible, state can say no tagline. that's that's considered hateful against uh against other people you can't do that but they can't say simply because you're the Westboro Baptist Church if they put up a benign christmas tree then you know all good i feel that you know if so long as lawmakers consider pluralism and have that genuinely internalized as a value and they start thinking about public forums and assume that controversial and alternative voices 
may come in and they decide that with that in mind, it's okay to have this forum anyways. You know, it, it's it's less divisive to have people of multiple points of view within within this. It, it Maybe it's a good civics lesson for people to see these things together in a forum overall. Uh, then, then you're doing fine. I, I just think when people come in and they feel like, okay, we want this to benefit this one group because these people are coming in and saying they want to do this, but uh, they're not going to be tolerant of anybody else, I think, then then it's crossing a line. And I think it has to do more than just with the intention of legislation, because I think the intention of legislation ends up getting obscured by the standard protocols, which always write in the language of pluralism, which then becomes mystifying to some of the people who endorse the legislation because they didn't expect for any alternative groups to actually engage with what was being suggested to begin with. Wait, what? I, you guys are trying to do what? No, you're not allowed <laughs> to do that. Right, right. I, I, I do think that as a society, though, we need to, again, rediscover the value in principles. We need to rediscover the value in having neutral laws that can equally benefit people we don't agree with and learn to live with that disagreement. I think we need to have people getting over this idea that they can impose their lifestyles and personal restrictions on other groups of people. I think we're going to have to realize that we already live in a pluralistic world. Sometimes I feel like we have people who are in denial of that and they're trying to retain something in their minds that just isn't there. And, and, and it would be better if they could feel a bit more comfortable living with the notion that their neighbors might have lifestyles that are alien to them. And it doesn't necessarily make them moral monsters. You know, so... So I'd love to kind of get maybe um, an idea of what like a, a typical church service um, looks like. Um, you know, if there's music, what kind of music? Is it Nickelback or is it like ministry? You know, like <laughs> I, I, I'm curious. So w w walk us through like what of your typical church service? It's clearly Marilyn Manson. Well, <laughs> no way, Jose. Is it? I'm well, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't draw a salary from the Satanic Temple, so I have to make my money other ways. So I, I write uh, on Substack and Patreon for subscribers. But I also have a band, and it's called Satanic Planet. And <laughs> nice. I would say it's it's much more ministry than it is Nickelback. See, but that see, said, see. there isn't so much a uniform culture of what uh, the self-identified Satanist thinks of as their aesthetic anymore. And I think. We're part of the problem there. We really ruined that. I think when we first came in, uh, there was kind of this tendency for the self-identified Satanist to be uh, a white kid of the goth aesthetic, and, mm -hmm. and now it's now it's it's grown far more diverse than that. So I don't, I can't even really speak to necessarily what uh, you know what the. The, the primary uh, musical interest is anymore. But our services are something we really started during the COVID time period. And as soon as it was clear that a pandemic was breaking loose and before we knew what the complete depth of this would be, and there was just the uh, the, the notion that we would be uh, locked up and isolated indefinitely, we began working really hard and fast to make... Uh, uh, remote communication much easier for us. And we we did, uh, to that end, put together a few of our own platforms. We have the satanictemple.tv now where we stream stuff. And come we on, actually, somebody. We, we have Tuesday services and you can you can come. You, you can come view them at any time. And uh, well, I mean, not any time when they're when they're streaming. <laughs> but but Tuesday nights is, is when that happens. And, and you're invited to attend. There's a there's a chat on the side and there's there's a variety of topics being discussed and people can discuss things from the the obscure to the very imminent. And it's usually put through the framework of how do we best approach this as rational 
people dri- motivated by our by our tenants. Like so, so are there like ordained, you know, speakers or anything? Yeah, well, we have uh, an ordained ministry program, and it's online coursework, and it we have eight or ten lectures or so that they have to go through when write essays, and we want to make sure that they're proper representatives for what we are advocating for. Is sometimes, you know, the the more difficult thing is to uh, teach people what isn't in our purview. And I feel like that's something that's lost on people a lot of times now, too, in this social media era to sound like an old fart now. But um, the, the notion that we all have media. to have an absolute opinion on every topic as soon as it comes to the fore, whether we've read about it or not. And I feel like that is also driving a lot of the tribalism people have. They see that. You know, what's supposed to be their side of politics has come to some kind of seeming consensus on some issue. And whether that consensus is ridiculous or not, it's clear to them what the right side is because it's more in alignment with how they've identified tribally. And I feel like that is really a difficult thing to try to break people of in a culture that is seemingly fueled by it. Yeah. So. You know, I, I, I use Nickelback in ministry for a reason, because like I was going to I was going to tell you that if if you don't have a small group named Jesus built my hot rod, I feel like it's just a lost opportunity because uh, as a I, I used to love ministry um, and uh, I, I know you wouldn't guess it as a black man, but I, I've got I've got some heavy metal roots. Um, so so um, so you don't have a small group name. Jesus built my hot rod. Do you No. But I, I I do have my band Satanic Planet and Dave Lombardo from uh, Slayer is in, in Satanic Planet. What? As, as well as <laughs> Justin Pearson from uh, a band called The Locust, which you might not know if you nice. were born to kind of punk stuff. And, <laughs> and Luke Henshaw from uh, Planet B. That's awesome. Yeah. So so are do you have any members that are famous that you are surprised are a part of? of your organization. Yeah, but I, I don't, uh, I, I, uh, don't want to say their name. I don't know who's comfortable being mentioned. (laughs) Sure. Sure. I'm, I'm usually, uh, it's, it's interesting to me how I get outreach from people or I'll talk to people and you know, they, they have a, uh, they can have a large public presence, but how hesitant they'll be to have a real public association with that. And sometimes it seems a little silly for how much of the satanic imagery they'll use, but to to make it real is is a step too far for a lot of people. So I don't want to I don't want to go too far and mention anybody who's going to say, "Oh shit, what?" Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, dude. Why'd you do this to me? That makes so much sense. Absolutely, man. Man, this is I I I can't tell you, man. I just so appreciate this conversation because I love being able to talk to people who uh, very, very, you know, are, are very different in their views. And yet feel like I can really talk to them. I can really be heard. I can hear them. I don't have to feel threatened when I hear them. You know, I got to ask, what is like in terms of representation, is there any representation in Congress and what how are you are you like pushing for that kind of like, hey, we need some Congress members that are, you know, like everyone. Oh, that that guy's an evangelical Christian. I want him in the White House. So they're, oh, he's part of the satanic temple. That guy needs to be in the White House. And I guess on top of that, this is just random. Do you ever think we'll have a satanic temple member as a president of the United States of America? So go ahead. You yeah, can but, take those as what you want. You know, these kinds of estimates of the future just totally i, I think at the point of where, course it's a fool's errand you, well at this point yeah more so than ever i feel um 2020 really broke me of making future predictions and <laughs> uh, people used to uh it used to tweet at me or, or write to me and say you should run for president and i would think what are they thinking like of course that can't happen 
And now I see, you know, the political playing field. And it I can think, happen, well, that's bro. Not, yeah, <laughs> that, that could happen. Yeah, it's not 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 a ridiculous. If Trump can uh, win, dude. Didn't the guy it, who brother. was drinking his own pee run for Congress? And and did he maybe not win? Or maybe did he win? There was a there was a viral <laughs> video of a guy peeing in his mouth, and I, I I'm pretty sure he he also ran for Congress, and he probably would have been a better congressman than one. some of the. I mean, how good was his? Rain? Rain? Oh, he, he seemed to be getting it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. Oh, okay, so la- last last question, Lucian. Uh, so, um, I know that Lucian Greaves is a pseudonym, um, and I I'd love for you to maybe just talk about one of the reasons that you use a pseudonym um versus your your real name i mean just based off some articles and whatnot that i've 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 read you know i i know that you were getting death threats or and just other i'm sure you know just concerns about your own safety so so maybe maybe talk about kind of just that that part of of your involvement in the satanic temple yeah that that's been that was a real hard adjustment for me because I mean, unfortunately, like I said from the beginning, my uh, I, I never had an interest in being uh, an influencer or somebody that people paid attention to. So the social dynamic between me and the rest of the world, I feel like I was already a socially awkward and shy person. So that happening was it was a difficult I it was a difficult adjustment for me. I, I did I it was just. I, I had a hard time with that, and it's it's gotten better since. I can imagine. You know, I, yeah, yeah. Well, some people are 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 made for that kind of thing, you know, or, or at least they, <laughs> they're better made for it than me. I've seen people handle that. I think a, a lot better than me. I, I had to fight against or outright agoraphobia, you know, and just uh, in, in just kind of only having moments of peace I felt like around 3 a.m. when nobody else was doing anything else you know like in, in the worst part about it was it was it was so fast and sudden like when we started getting attention like I was flooded with interviews like I might not be a household name but like from you know from where I was sitting especially because I do so many local interviews in places too it feels like I'm, I'm doing interviews all the time and I'm speaking now, in retrospect, I feel like I probably only could have adapted to this through that initiation by fire, you know. Mm. And so I, I was re- at the beginning, like I said, I was really hoping that I could kind of write the material, write the justifications. I didn't think people would be that interested in it where there'd be all these requests for live interviews, televised interviews and other such things. And I saw immediately I wasn't going to get away with that. and then. You know, uh, there was those fears, especially knowing what happened to people during the satanic panic that, you know, my life could be ruined by this. My reputation would forever be attached, by, you know, to this idea of being a public representative of, of Satanism. And the death threats started right away. You know, uh, a year ago, a bit more than a year ago, some group of sovereign citizens publicly posted a $200 two hundred thousand dollar bounty on my head dead or alive and uh we had to submit that to the fbi and you know just things like that and uh you know it was actually a a source of calm for me to a certain degree to come to realize how uh it's horrifying to say but just how common this kind of thing is like then I started hearing about all the other people getting death threats for the most benign things. And then my band put out an album and people were expressing outrage that Dave Lombardo wasn't playing drums on some of the tracks, but was doing, you know, electronic noise and stuff like that. And for that, you can have people threatening death upon you. And then I started calming down a little bit about it. And I was thinking, OK, I guess this is just where we're at now in culture, you know, and. I, I, it made me realize that it wasn't only that I was deal, dealing with something that was very polarizing to people, but that we're just in a very polarized world. So to what degree my the 
the level of hatred I get and the death threats I get are unique is unknown to me. But I do also know we are living in particularly perilous times when it comes to trying to have rational discussion. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd imagine that, you know, going on the Tucker Carlson show, which which I know you 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 did probably wasn't wasn't necessarily good for your psyche maybe good for advertising you know just just to get the name out because 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 i was i was thinking i finally remember what i was going to say about the abortion thing is that the the reason i knew about the samuel Lito abortion thing is because i i saw a lot of my christian friends post about it <laughs> and and so like you know next time you you meet a christian group just thank them for the free advertisement um uh, but you know but anyways so my uh my last easy last last easy question is how can people learn more about um your organization what you're all about um how can they get connected with you and i and i figured it was probably better me asking you this question versus josh because his mom would kill him if he asked that question <laughs> so so how can people learn more about you should I turn on the light before I answer that question or is would it no. then cut and make things no, no. too confusing no, for people? Fine. Like it adds to the to the whole aura. So just Yeah, no, I'm sorry. It gets so dark it gets dark so early here. I just kind it of, does here too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, anyways, people want to learn more about us, just look look at our website, thesataniktemple.com. Follow us on social media. I don't manage the social media, so I don't even know all the... Pl- I only have a Twitter <laughs> account anymore. Mm-hmm. Twitter currently known as X because of some dumb decision. But uh, but yeah, you can, you can follow us and, and keep up with the updates there and see the different projects we're working on and if there's a congregation near you. And as I said, people can check in on our Tuesday services and and just kind of get involved in the discussion and we always are are open to uh people who are just curious to uh non-trolling people who are genuinely curious and, and want answers is something we're we're more than happy to deal with and are available for awesome well uh thank you so much lucian for uh, spending some time with us this has been uh phenomenal um i appreciate your time your words and, and yes, thank you. And I just, I just wish you all the success. Um, you know, may, you know, your, your numbers rise. Um, and, uh, yeah, thanks. Well, I, I, I love what you guys are doing. Just knowing that you're, you, you follow the format you do and that you're looking for, uh, challenging discussions and the fact that you, uh, you you yourselves hold uh opposing viewpoints on certain fundamental things but co-host a show together i think is an excellent thing and exactly the type of thing i'm i'm interested in advocating for and with that in mind if you ever want me on again i'm happy to pop on anytime awesome yeah thank you so much and uh, and for our audience uh yeah thanks for uh stopping by and make sure you keep your conversations not left or right but up we'll see you next time take care bye